Hello, my name is Wandi Kazim from Wandivo Media. Today we have Dr. Rose Gidado, Assistant Director of the National Biotechnology Development Agency, NAVDA. She's also the Nigerian Country Coordinator for Open Forum for Agricultural Biotechnology, OFA. Join me and let's speak to Dr. Rose Gidado today. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Wandi. So Dr. Gidado, can you tell us how you got into the agricultural sector? How I went into the Greek um, and agriculture industry is because um, I have a PhD in uh, food science and technology. I have also a master's degree in microbiology and a PhD in microbiology. And I work with the National Biotechnology Development Agency. How long have you been there for? Um, I've been there since 2002. Uh, but before I came to NAPDA, I was in Shader Science and Technology Complex, Shade School, along Loko Jaru. I was also working in the Biotechnology Advanced Lab. So can you tell us what OFAB's objective and mission is? What was OFAB created? Um, OFAB was actually created to create awareness, to sensitize the general public on agricultural biotechnology for good uptake of this technology, to raise the profile of this technology, to make for better understanding of this technology by the different sectors in the societies, by the policy makers, law makers, by the media, by the farmers, by the civil society groups, and all, even by other professional bodies who have difficulties in understanding what the technology is all about. Our vision is actually to ensure a food secure Africa, to bridge that gap that exists between the scientists who have been working in this area, who have been developing the genetically modified crops, be it anywhere, and the general public. You know. Do you think the opposition, because in America it's more welcomed, but in Europe there's more opposition, do you think the opposition from Europe is influencing African countries? Yeah, of course, the opposition in Europe is influencing African countries. Why? Because most of us in Africa um, were colonized um, by Europe. So Africans like believe so much in Europe. But I tell you, Europe is the second largest consumer of GM. Mm. Um, we have the statistics. They spend 9 billion US dollars importing HT soybeans and BT meats for feed and for food. And then we have other countries in Europe that are cultivating. Spain um, is, is one of each. Netherlands is also one of each. And um, I think before they came to a consensus, um, Europe sponsored 130 research and those researches I think um, went on for like 25 years wow. and it was carried out by 500 independent uh, groups you can see how serious they are when they want to do something so and at the end they came to the conclusion that genetically modified crops foods organisms are as safe as their conventional counterparts. That's surprising to hear because and I think from there that's when like they started accepting this uh, technology. In Nigeria we're trying to achieve food security for our growing population. How do you think adoption of biotechnology can help us achieve food security in Nigeria? The adoption of biotechnology will help tremendously for us to achieve food security, you know, we're talking about diversification of the economy. And so for us to really get 
um, into business, we need to use appropriate technologies. We need to apply technologies to agriculture. And biotechnology is actually one of um, those promising tools that can help. Is is a good tool uh, in the toolbox of, of the breeders. And so, and how will it help in the development of um, drought tolerant crops, uh, insect resistant crops, um, for salinity, for the crops to be able to stand salinity, especially rice? And for nutritional enhancement, we need that in this area, especially in the northeast where we have the Boko Haram and all the insurgency is um, actually affecting um, you know, food availability and making food to be you know, short and all. So we need uh, to actually enhance our crops to, you know, to be able to provide the necessary micronutrients that the children and mothers, the lactating mothers, the pregnant mothers, um, to have enough, you know, um, so that the children will not be malnourished because malnutrition is very, very dangerous. It's a killer. One thousand children die every day in Nigeria due to malnutrition. So, with this technology, I think um, the farmer, of course, is of use to the farmer. The farmer is the first um, beneficiary. The farmer will have higher yields in terms of yields because if you take away those challenges that we have, the insect and pest infestation, you know, the global warming is making it um, more conducive for insects to multiply, you know, lay eggs everywhere because they, have, they like um, hot, you know, conditions and all. So it makes it warmer, it makes it more conducive and all. And so uh, that's why we're having all these problems. And in the fall army war of last year, it was so devastating. And we currently so, have one, we have it in Ghana mm -hmm. and in Kenya this year. Yes, this year. So how can biotechnology so, mitigate so this So biotech can mitigate, of course, based on the understanding of the DNA. Mm -hmm. You can manipulate genes. Of course, you can do it either way. You either bring a gene from outside, from another crop, from a tree that you know that maybe um, that tree is surviving in the desert and it must have a gene in it that's making it to survive. So you identify the gene and pick it up. It's a precision agriculture. You pick it and put it maybe in your corn so that your corn will be able to withstand the drought. And with the use of this technology, at least they were able to um, produce. The productivity was high, but you could see, you know, the height of the cotton or the maize, you know, stunted growth and all observed in them. And so it wasn't really funny. Without this technology, I don't think we can survive in Africa. at all in Africa. It's very difficult and we need to do something and it's very urgent. Let's so go. if you take away those problems from your crops, you have yield, higher yield. And farming is all about harvestable yield and strong yields. If you have strong yields, I think you've got it all. So the farmer, uh, the farmer's profit becomes higher. The profit margin goes higher. He becomes empowered. You know, he can now transit from the subsistence farming that he has been enslaved to from time immemorial to business farming. Mm -hmm. He'll be able to take his children to school. And that's what this technology can do for you. He's doing this in other parts of the world. He's doing it in the US. He's doing it in Brazil. He's doing it in Argentina. He's doing it in Japan. So why would Africa be different? We need to tap into this technology to actually reap the benefits that others are, are reaping, combined with mechanization and good farm management practices. You can do it, we can achieve it, for sure. So it's just for Nigeria to, um, you know, reprioritize, let's place our priorities right. Um, the government needs to have that political will to put in um, so much fun in research and development. You know, we have research institutes, agro-research institutes, I think they're like 15 or 16. 
let's form those research institutes and then you know equip their laboratories update you know whatever is there and let the scientists have a good you know working environment and all we need that we need the basic infrastructures um, pharma could have good yield strong yield with this technology but if other things infrastructures are not put in place um, like the road if we don't have good road network if we don't have good uh, transport systems whatever he has is like in the no, case of the loss post harvest loss is there to check mate, to take away all you have if you go to Benue most of their vegetables most of the fruits most of their own waste so it's um it's, it has to be a holistic system the infrastructure the basic ones the light the electricity which is very very key we need to have it we need to have refrigerated transport systems we need to have good roads for the farmer to be able to move his things you know um, safely without mechanical injuries without accidents or without the vehicles breaking down and all so it's we just have to put heads together as as government the federal ministry of works they should have their own the roads and work and then we have the electricity to be taken care of from the, um, the power ministry then the agri ministry of course um, is to provide the science and tech ministry to provide the technology and then the agri ministry also to do I like putting heads all together to achieve those common goals. Ethiopia today, Ethiopia is far ahead of us. Ethiopia that I think Nigeria used to give food aids. Today they've taken up the technology and their government is very serious about it. I visited the laboratory, the molecular biology lab, fantastic. What are they? What are they going in Ethiopia apparently? They're going into agriculture. They're using this technology to develop their crops. And what crops? They are developing cotton and corn, and they're going to have the water efficient means for Africa, which has been developed for drought tolerance and also insect resistance. Chief Oluwajo Mbasanjo is a big supporter of OFA. Can you tell us some of the works? He's, I think he was currently speaker at one of your events. Can you tell us yeah. more how he's been yeah. supporting? He, he, he was um, a keynote speaker. We organized um, a Southwest um, Journal <coughs> Biotechnology and Biosafety Workshop. Uh, and the target audience, of course, the farmers, the grassroots, is to reach out to the grassroots, reach out to the different states, so that they will have better understanding. He's our grand patron. He's our champion uh, because it was during his tenure that um, National Biotechnology Development Agency was created in 2001. He was actually also the one who signed the Katahina Protocol on Biosafety. And Biosafety, of course, is a regulatory framework for the modern practice um, of biotechnology. It regulates um, biotechnology. So he signed that. And so I think he has contributed a lot to the biotechnology industry. He supported the setting up of NAPDA. He supported um, Nigeria being a signatory to the biosafety protocol. You know. And so he actually um, puts in, can I say, the foundation for the technology of this technology and its regulation. Mm, because of the way um, people mystify the technology. So that regulation actually is uh, a checkmate, you know, and then it gives confidence to people because when people are assured of the safety and world, since we have, without a regulatory framework, people will not have confidence in, in the component, uh, genetically modified products or confidence in um, either planting or so. Tell us about the meats that that being observed. Tell us more about more information. Yeah, the, 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 the meats that are being observed, the meats that people the peddle around is that uh, it causes cancer, it um, causes sterility, um, a name, and uh, all kinds. There's nothing they just say about it. 
but those things are, I want to tell you today that they are not um, scientifically founded. We believe in science. Yeah. So are you telling me there's no scientific research that has linked GM crops to sterility, cancer, no. or health no. diseases? No. In history, in the history of man, GM foods are the most regulated. They're the most scrutinized in the history of man. Um, and you know that the US, I think they have the most stringent rules, regulations, and what in their countries. The technology originated from there, and the technology has a safe history of use. 22 years safe history of use this year. So with that safe history, and it's not only in US, in Canada, Brazil, and all, uh, there hasn't been any case, you know, of someone consuming a GM product and either having cancer or dying or what. There is nothing in history. It's a scientific tool and um, it's highly regulated. And you know that science is a collection of facts, it's evidence based. Everything we do is evidence based. How about technology impacting climate change? It's impacting climate change and with biotechnology, you'll be able to produce crops that will be drought tolerant because the climate change bring it, brings in a desertification, you know, and then rising temperature. There's, let me quote the research carried out by ELO et al. 2014. It states that for every two degrees rise in temperature, there are seeds of sorghum millet rice that will not germinate. You can only use this technology to mitigate that challenge because the climate change brings in rising temperature. And you know that a reduction in the use of fertilizer because you are developing crops um, for less farm inputs. Fertilizer is one of the farm inputs. If I'm developing my crop to be able to make maximum use of the nitrogen, you know we have nitrogen in the air, but plants cannot trap it direct. You know, so that I can genetically engineer my crop to, to the little nitrogen that's available to make maximum use of it, it's, it's fine. The residual effect on the environment, you know, when rain falls, it washes down to the river, and then the accumulation of it around the environment in, increases um, the greenhouse gas effects. That's it. And that greenhouse gas effects, Things like um, carbon monoxide, carbon, you know, the, the accumulation of that actually um, rises up, increases the temperature, and once the environment becomes warm, it's, it's a problem to the crops and all. And also, this um, deforestation, cutting down trees, tilling the soil, and what you, the all like contribute to the global warming, to the climate change. With this, uh, we have what we call herbicide tolerant um, soybeans that has been developed for glyphosate resistance or what herbicide resistance. So you spray your crops and then the weeds there, they die up. So there's no, so we call it no tillage agriculture. And then you don't even need to till the soil. How has Nigerian farmers embraced biotechnology in Nigeria, in Africa? Nigerian farmers are very, very anxious to have um, biotech crops. They can't wait to get the, the seeds because they hear a lot of testimonies from other farmers, um, from other countries in the world, from India, testimonies from India, testimonies from South Africa, testimonies from US, um, testimonies from Canada, Brazil, Argentina, so many countries um, 
because of the benefits, the huge benefits that uh, comes from the use of these crops. And so farmers in other countries, uh, their lives have been empowered uh, because of yields. You know, they have strong yields, they can get yields, some even up to 50% yields, 24% yield, 20% yield. It depends on the traits that has been put in that crop and it depends on good farm management practices and combined with mechanization, there's quite a lot to benefit from that. Um, they are able to take their children to school, they're empowered, they have money. As I went to US, I went to South Africa in US and I interacted with the farmers and they told me what they get. A lot of money, you know. 18, over 18 million farmers have benefited from this, from the use of their gym crops. Uh, because the benefits really, they are much, you know. Reduction in pesticide use, you know. Uh, and then the reduction in other farm inputs, fertilizer and all. Strong yields, quality seeds, access to quality seeds access to quality products and then uh, less labor intensiveness is there because a reduction in the pesticide use of course you don't need to carry can in your bag going around to spray and all wasting all the time uh, time is saved water is saved because in those arid areas water is an essential commodity because if you're spraying you use you know large volume of water so this what what do you see there's health benefit because the farmer, as he reduces those number of space, the number of space could reduce from eight down to two. Especially, an example is the one we have in Nigeria, the BT copy. It's almost getting to commercialization, and it was tried on the farmer's field. The farmers planted on their own field. They harvested. They planted it side by side with their own local variety that they're using. And I tell you, the BT cup even has an unintended benefit. And that unintended benefit is that, <coughs> is that it became water efficient. There was early cessation of rain last year. But you know that they planted them same time, same treatment, everything. That early cessation of rain affected their own crop. But the BT beans was mature on time. The early cessation of rain did not affect it, but it was actually developed for Maruka lever. It does, Maruka is an insect, it's a lever. The Maruka lever resistance. But you see now, it becomes another thing was added to it. So, with that now, Nigeria stands to make with that scalp annually. 8 billion naira, that's in terms of the monetary aspect, that is per annum, that's what it can generate, the revenue that we can generate from the use of this copy once farmers begin to plant it. So with that, the farmer becomes empowered, the farmer becomes goes so happy that he has had something. And there is market for all those things, even though Presently, we have a deficit of 500,000 tons in uh, beans in production in Nigeria. So, I know that deficit is being made up every year by importation. But with this uh, BT copy, it can stop Nigeria from importing. Instead, we we'll produce enough to export. Because Maruka is not the only insect that affects it, but Maruka causes. Um, a big damage and once that damage is done farmers can lose up to 90 percent of what they have cultivated so that's why it's a lot. is it true that gm crops will enslave farmers uh, gm crops will not enslave farmers uh, but that's the information the misinformation that people always get you know farming is about harvestable yield and uh, I know this is attributed to the seed companies that develop uh, this crop. It's a win-win situation. The farmer will benefit. The seed company will benefit. Don't forget that these companies 
put in money, their own money into the research and development of this um, technology. Because without it, you can't move forward. You know, there are so many emerging problems, you know, as in any research that you carry. And um, there's a kind of translational research because the research will impact on the lives of people. Any research that will not impact on the lives of people, you know, forget about it. So it's like, okay, you're buying seed from me and you're planting and the seed I'm giving you is a quality seed. It's going to give you 100% germination because I have up-to-date facilities of storing those seeds which the farmer does not have because the farmer is not empowered enough and he doesn't have that knowledge for him to have those you know facilities that can keep seeds the seeds they save and keep the next planting season maybe maybe half of it will germinate because they don't have the facilities they just keep them in their ground in fact some of them are great they're not seeds you can call them seeds. The farmer has, hardly has a seed because it's grains that they store. And of course the grains will not give you quality what you really desire. So with this, there's, there's going to be much difference. Let me give you an example with the hybrid seeds now. Um, GM is not hybrid, it's different from hybrid. Hybrid is developed for, for yield while um, GM is developed for threats you, know, you put in a threat without drought or the insect rest or what so that does not mean you but it means you're just it's helping you to take away the problems associated with that seed and all but uh, for for hybrid it is actually you so if uh, a farmer buys hybrid seeds this year okay the money is not much he plants the yield he's going to get next year, he will come back and buy. But the yield he's going to get next year is going to be triple the yield of the previous year. Of course, this is about yield. If I have strong yields, that means profit for me as a farmer. And uh, that profit I'm going to make, of course, will enable me to go buy more seeds. And then I'm also going to sell, I'm going to make money. So what is it? So what's the slavery for? There's no slavery. If a farmer does not see benefit, he will not go back. That's just it. But they prefer to, you know, always go because they don't have the modern facilities. And then let me tell you something about GM. Um, for GM technology, except if I have put in my threat in a hybrid seed, I don't have to go back to be buying seeds, do you understand? It's only the hybrid seeds that you have to go back to be buying. So if it's GM seeds, you don't have to go back? You don't have to, except if the parent of the seed I have developed is a hybrid parent. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes... I don't think a lot of people are aware about that. Sometimes the scientists would like to use uh, the hybrid as a parent because the hybrid gives you yield. Okay. So when you combine the yield with insect resistance, you're going to have more. Do you understand? So that's the logic. But of course, it's not every seed that is hybrid. Like the sorghum we are working on is not hybrid. The, the technology is being transferred. The genes are being transferred across into uh, the local varieties of sorghum that we have in Nigeria. And those, those varieties are the farmer's preferred varieties and they're not hybrid so the farmer can keep you safe how safe are gm crops in nigeria and how safe are gm products in nigeria gm crops in nigeria are very safe because we have a regulatory agency in place the national biosafety management agency which um, of course was created after the signing of the biosafety bill into an act in 2015 and so they actually ensure, they regulate the practice of this technology. They ensure that whatever is being brought in, like the product you're talking about, GM product being brought in, 
because when you go to our groceries, our supermarkets, uh, we have quite a number of uh, GM products there, complex, you know, one, biscuits, um, all, you know, because some of them are products of corn, you know, the sweet corn, the world, and 98%, no, 88% of corn in South Africa and corn in the US is GM. And we have products coming from those. So they're mostly in our shops. So I think these days, with the by safety agency in place, um, every dealer, every supermarket um, owner has been asked and then is being mandated to get approval from the National Bar Safety Management Agency. Anything, either greens, either wall, because most greens um, that are being used to process poultry feeds, they're GM. So, and I think they're all complying now. Many approvals have been given for some agri-like industries, importing GM greens from Brazil, from Argentina, different countries. And this was not known. It's <laughs> the coming in of NBME that actually oh, has NBME, NBM, the National Bar Safety Management Agency, that has made people to know that uh, so we have been you know, uh, we have been having GM products in our grocery stores and 